If I were to say four score and seven years ago, what would that remind you of? The Gettysburg Address, right? But if you'd never heard the Gettysburg Address or heard of it, you'd have absolutely no idea what I was talking about. What's a score anyway? Well, what about if I said, Toto, I have a feeling we aren't in Kansas anymore. You'd know that it's a reference to the Wizard of Oz. And all of a sudden that picture flashes into your mind. It's because those are among the things that we're culturally conditioned to understand. And knowing that some phrases that we hear were culturally conditioned to get a certain picture or understanding in our mind is going to help us go deeper in the scripture that we have today. Because there's a surface reading of the text, which honestly is where a lot of people stay, and then there's what the text is really getting at. And that's what we're going to try to do today. So we're in Matthew 22, verses 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. So we've been looking at some interesting and challenging passages in the Gospel of Matthew since last April. And there's generally so much more in the texts than have met the eye. So knowing that you can make the Bible say almost anything that you want it to say, how have we been doing or how do you do responsible Bible study? A couple of, words, a couple of weeks ago, I tossed out the word exegesis. And that's one of the terms that we use. How do you do biblical exegesis? Exegesis is a Greek word that basically means to explain or to interpret something. something. So to exegete something, particularly the Bible, is figuring out how to interpret what it says. So one principle we've talked about a number of times is that context is king. You have to put the passage in the context of the paragraph it was written in, in the context of the book that it was written in, and in the context of what we know about Jesus and God. And that's why we've spent so much time in the Gospel of Matthew, because we want to be able to recognize what Jesus looks like. We've heard so many things in the culture, in the news, that are attributed to Jesus, and a lot of them I listen to and I'm like, that just doesn't sound like Jesus to me. So it's important to take what, we, what we're reading in the scriptures, what people are saying, and interpret that in the context of who we know Jesus to be. Another one, and that's new for this week, is that the Bible was written for you, but it wasn't written to you. And what I mean by that is that the Bible was written to people two to 3,000 years ago, who, while similar to us in so many ways, had a lot of different experiences. And so, in order to understand what the Bible is saying, the question that we have to begin with is, how did the people that it was written to understand it? And then when we know how they would have understood it, that's where we take the lesson for, from. So the Bible is for us, but it wasn't written to people who were living in the United States in the 21st century. It was written to people who were living in the Eastern Mediterranean in the first century of the Common Era. So that's very important to think about. And that's why I gave the examples at the beginning of the sermon. You hear, we aren't in Kansas anymore, differently than somebody who isn't from our culture, who doesn't have the shared experiences that we have and maybe lived in a different time in a different place. If you've never seen The Wizard of Oz, you have no idea what that means. And you're like, well, first of all, my name is not Toto. And obviously, we are not in Kansas, we're in Washington. And you will have completely missed the point of the saying. So from our viewpoint, as we look at this passage of scripture today, it's like the point of the story is pay your taxes. 
And Jesus actually believes in paying taxes. There's a story about him doing it in Matthew 17. Or maybe the point of the story is Jesus is a really good debater and you shouldn't argue with him. Or maybe the point of the story is don't try and trick Jesus, which actually could be a whole sermon on its own. But that's just what we see when we look at the text. But that's not how the people who originally heard it would have heard it. And how they heard it is going to take us to a different and more profound place. So let's figure out the story. First, who are the people involved in the story? There's two groups here. Think of them as two political parties. That's the easiest for us. The Herodians and the Pharisees. So the Herodians. They're a little bit hard to figure out because they're only mentioned three times in the New Testament. And I think a lot of times people just assume they're the Sadducees, but because we're more familiar with the Sadducees, but they aren't. It's a separate group, but it's hard to know exactly who they are. They're probably very influential people. They might be leaders in the community. What we do know is, mostly because of their name, is they are the people, or who come from the families of people, who supported Herod the Great. And now, they support his son, Herod Antipas. So the, the important thing to know about the Herodians are, they support Rome. Not because they're so wild about Rome, but because Rome props up their guy. And Herod Antipas is their guy. And so, because Rome props up their guy, they've basically reached an accommodation with the government. And they can work with the government to further their objectives. And their objectives are basically to remain in power. And the Herodians do not like Jesus. Why? Because he's upsetting the apple cart. We don't need some revolutionary dreamer coming in here and stirring up trouble. Let's keep the peace and let's keep the status quo. That's why the Herodians are against Jesus. And then you have the Pharisees. Well, the Pharisees are conservative religious people who are really irked by the Roman occupation. They would love to overthrow Rome. And in fact, the last time that an occupying power was overthrown, it was Pharisees who helped to do it. And they don't like Jesus either, for different reasons. They don't approve of him. They don't like what he stands for. They don't like what he says. They don't like what he does. They don't like his friends. Jesus is not religious in the way that they think you should be religious. Oh, the irony. If religion is a set of rules that you have to keep that makes you superior to other people and doesn't make you a loving and kind person, then yes, Jesus is not very religious. So the Herodians and the Pharisees get together. They're kind of odd bed bedfellows. But I think it's kind of a, the enemy of my enemy is my friend type thing. So they've come together on a mission to get rid of Jesus. And so they approach Jesus and they say some sickeningly sweet, ultra flattering things to Jesus that doesn't fool him at all. I imagine him just rolling his eyes as they're going on and on about how wonderful he is. And then they get to what they really want to get to. They're going to try and trip him up. And so they say, is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? And this is super divisive. So what they're trying to do is to get Jesus in trouble with one group or another. Should we pay taxes? And immediately, everybody's listening because it's such a controversial topic. And no matter how Jesus answers, he's going to make somebody mad. If he says, no, don't pay taxes, he'll be in trouble with the government. And that's what the Herodians want. In fact, in Luke chapter 20, a parallel passage, it says they're expecting him to say not to pay taxes. And they plan on going straight to the governor and telling him that. If Jesus says, yes, pay taxes, He'll be in trouble with the people. And that's what the Pharisees want. Because the people hate Rome and they want it overthrown. they are actually people that are looking at Jesus as being their political hope. Maybe this is the one who will become our king. And skipping ahead a little bit in the story, that's ultimately why Jesus is, bes is betrayed by Judas Iscariot. Because Judas has political goal, goals that he thinks that Jesus will help him accomplish. And when Jesus doesn't do that, Judas no longer has use for him, so he betrays him. 
Interesting, like Christ is not Jesus' last name, but a description of who he is. Iscariot is not Judas' last name either. It's the political party that he belongs to. It's an extreme political group that advocates a violent overthrow of the government, and they're known primarily for political assassinations. They assassinate Romans and Jews who they think are collaborating with them. So that won't be on the test. I just think that's interesting. So they're trying to get Jesus to offend somebody. And Jesus sees right through it, what they're trying to do. And he says, show me the coin. Well, again, culturally, we don't really understand what's going on because the coin is a part of the problem. And here is a picture of what a denarius during the reign of Tiberius Caesar would have looked like. It's an excellent uh, copy of it. It's super expensive. None of us could afford it. You can buy them cheaper on eBay. But this is a really good copy. And what you see is on one side a picture of Tiberius Caesar, and he's no great looker. And on the other side is a Roman goddess. So, and then there's an inscription around it. And the inscription on the front with the picture of Tiberius basically says, Tiberius Caesar Augustus, son of the divine Augustus. And on the back side, it says Pontifex Maximus, which means chief priests. So on this one coin, you have Caesar claiming to be the son of God and also claiming to be the high priest. You couldn't be more offensive to Jews and their sensitivity than to have this coin and to believe these things. Basically, what this is saying is Caesar is God. And the last time somebody tried to put a, um, an icon or an image of somebody else in the temple, Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, from the Seleucid Empire, that would be on the test either, um, it caused the, re the Maccabean Revolt, which eventually led to about 100 years of Jewish sovereignty. So they are very, very sensitive to idolatry, particularly in the temple. Now, the Romans, believe it or not, actually tried not to over-antagonize people. The Romans just wanted to keep the peace. And if they could keep the peace, they would. And so in order to keep the peace, they allowed the Jews to mint their own money. So the Jews don't really have to have these denarii in order to do business. So Jesus says, show me the coin. And this is loaded. Why did Jesus have to ask for the coin? Because he didn't have one. Now, does Jesus not have the coin because he's poor? I don't think so. I don't think he had the coin because what the coin represents is loyalty. And that's at the heart of what we're talking about. So Jesus had to ask for one. Well, lo and behold, who has one? The Herodians and the Pharisees have one. And not only is that shocking, but where do they have it? They have it in the temple. And that would have blown away most of the people who were standing there. Here is an icon in the temple of someone else claiming what only God can claim. Well, isn't that interesting? And that's one of the reasons why Jesus calls them hypocrites. And he asked them, whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Now, that just, like, that just sounds like Jesus is saying, pay your taxes. And here's where you have the cultural thing that we don't get. When people heard, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, they would have heard, we're not in Kansas anymore. Immediately, they would have gotten a cultural picture. Well, it wasn't Kansas that they heard. What they heard was a saying from the earlier Jewish rebellion when I talked about Antiochus Epiphanes. And one of the leaders of that rebellion, one of the high priests at the time, Mattathias, to help motivate the people, said, give to the Gentiles what belongs to the Gentiles. In other words, let's take the, the fight to them. So this is revolutionary language that people would have heard just by Jesus saying, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. They would have heard, this is time for revolution. Let's give Rome what it deserves. It's time for something new to happen. So part of it certainly is pay your taxes, 
But part of it is there's a revolution that's coming. In fact, there's a revolution that's already going on. But here's the thing that people continually miss. It's a different sort of revolution. Jesus isn't advocating compromise with Rome like the Herodians want, and he's not advocating a violent overthrow of the government, which is what the Pharisees want. The real revolution is going to come not through non-payment of taxes, which will result in a violent confrontation. The revolution is going to come through Jesus' death and resurrection and the people who follow Jesus and his kingdom. And that's what we've seen throughout the Gospel of Matthew that Jesus is setting up a new kingdom that does things differently. And that's why I think it's also important to note that we only usually read half of this verse, or emphasize half of it. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. But the real emphasis is on give to God what is God's. Well, what belongs to God? Worship? Our loyalty? And in this context, Jesus is saying, give to God and to him alone the divinity that's claimed by Caesar. It's a call to renounce other beliefs. It's a call to renounce paganism. It's a call to renounce syncretism, which is trying to put two things together that don't belong. To renounce all of those things and to worship and serve the one true God and no one else. That's what belongs to God that Jesus is talking about. I also want you to notice that when Jesus is looking at the coin, he doesn't say, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. He says, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's. In other words, you already have what belongs to Caesar. Give it back. Well, what do they have that belongs to Caesar? Money, sure. But Caesar's values? and Caesar's weapons, and Caesar's tactics. Jesus is saying, don't use the government's weapons to accomplish the purpose of God. What are the government's weapons? Generally fear, coercion, force. So their thinking of overthrowing Caesar in the name of God, but using Caesar's weapons. And what Jesus is saying is, you're the ones who have really compromised because you should use the weapons of the kingdom of God instead because the ends do not justify the means. So let me make a couple points of application. The first is, don't be a hypocrite. Don't be like the Herodians and the Pharisees. Don't claim to be a follower of Jesus and live no differently than anyone else. Don't claim to be pious but have an icon of an idol in your pocket. There are just too many examples of leaders who say one thing publicly and then turn out to do the opposite thing in private. And ultimately, the truth will come out. It doesn't mean that people don't make mistakes, you know, that you don't fall off the wagon or you use bad judgment, whatever. People do. But that's different from living two separate lives, one public and one private. And the reality of the gospel is demonstrated in changed lives. If we look no different than anyone else, or if what we say doesn't match up with what we actually do, why would anyone believe that Jesus makes a difference? And if we don't live consistently, if we do live hypocritically, we'll do harm to the cause of Christ ultimately because the people that were closest to us will know that. And you might even end up being opposed to God and his purposes. Don't be a hypocrite. Number two, join the right revolution. God has a plan and a purpose, what he's doing in the world, and it goes beyond making us comfortable and leaving us alone. God is in the process of redeeming the world, making everything new, changing people's hearts. It doesn't mean that we aren't interested in the government, but it affects how we approach the government and our politics. Because as followers of Jesus, our faith should inform our politics, not the other way around. If our politics is informing our faith, then we've got it wrong. So it's a call to be involved politically, absolutely. But we need to make sure that we're, what we're invested in politically is truly a kingdom issue, especially if that's what we're talking about publicly. Have your opinions. 
have your political preferences. But if you're going to claim to be a Jesus follower, make sure that your social media posts or your conversations accurately reflect who Jesus is and raise him up and glorify him rather than creating issues. Join the right revolution. And next, bring the right tools with you to the revolution. Don't use the tools of Caesar. Don't use the government or the culture's weapons to accomplish the purpose of God. Again, the weapons of the government are fear and coercion and force. God has the ends. We know how things are going to end up. We know God wins. We know truth wins. We know righteousness wins. We know justice wins. We know love wins. We know that's how it ends. But the means are also very important to God because it shows just how much we're buying into the community that God is creating. And the means will demonstrate in a very practical way whether we look more like the kingdom of God or the kingdom of Caesar. And the kingdom values are love and truth and grace and hope. There's this wonderful passage that comes out of Revelation chapter 12, 9. It says, The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. So all of those things are going to happen. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him. How? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimonies. So let me ask you three questions. When your friends describe you, which would they talk about most? Your brand of politics or your faith? Number two, what is an area of your life where you're more like the culture than the kingdom? Number three, what's an area of your life where you're more like the kingdom than the culture? Hi, thanks for watching. The people of Harbor Covenant Church really want you to know the love that God has for you, want to grow with you in faith, and want to serve alongside you, not only to help others do the same, but also to make our families and our communities better. If that sounds like something that you can get on board with, then like, follow, and drop us a comment in the video. Watch some more videos on our channel or come visit us on Sunday. You can find out more about Harbor Covenant Church at harborcove.church.